Well, good morning. As the seasons change and summer begins to shift into fall, we witness the foliage shift and we recognize that God is still in control. And so our prayer for you is that throughout our conversation today, God may be in control. And in order to ensure that that happens, it probably would behoove us to begin with a word of prayer. So can I invite you to pray? God, we want to thank you so much for being in charge, for not allowing the weight of our issues, our hang-ups, our fears to cause you to run. Lord, we are so grateful that you are a father that leans in, that you are a father that lifts up, that you are a father that builds us, and that you are a father that speaks truth into us. Mm -hmm. So may we lean, lean into this conversation. May, may we speak truthfully. May we be constructive. And may we use it for the edification of your church, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Dora Costa is a research economist at UCLA, but she is also a historian. And I don't know how she was able to do this, but she found a place in which history and economy intersect. Now, she looked at over 20,000 records of sons and daughters, brothers and sisters, aunts and uncles, cousins, spouses, all stemming from that era in America that threatened to divide and set the country asunder. I'm, of course, referring to that period between 1861 and 1865, the Civil War. Now, Costa particularly was interested in the effects that prison camps had on families whose members were interned in one such camp. Now, the most infamous of all the camps during the Civil War was one in Andersonville, Georgia. It was described as overcrowded, where prisoners typically faced starvation and the fear of being forgotten. Now, when Costa began to research the lives of those prisoners that had made Andersonville their home, she realized that their descendants had shorter lifespans than those descendants of people who hadn't been interned. It's interesting that she noticed that the levels of anxiety, depression, cancer, and even stroke were much higher with the descendants of these people that had suffered trauma, which caused her to posit the possibility that maybe trauma was inherited. The field of epigenetics looks at how experiences are passed down from generation to generation. It echoes a little bit the words of history. You remember when it says up to the third and the fourth generation? The study not only focused on people living in Andersonville, Georgia, over a century ago, it also looks at the generational trauma faced by Native Americans and their proclivities and propensities to have shorter lifespans and more health conditions, which has led many an epigeneticist to postulate that perhaps and just perhaps trauma can be passed down. I want you to think about that as we 
open our minds, our ears, and our hearts to the scripture for today. Today we're looking at Deuteronomy chapter 1. Now, the title of the lesson is Moses' History. And it's interesting uh, that the author of the book places us in a location that has meaning. We know where we are. As Moses, as Moses begins to utter these words, preparing a new generation to foray into Canaan, he delivers the missive from the infamous Kadesh Barnea. This is the same place where 40 years ago, a generation came and heard a report. Uh, Twelve young men entered Canaan and were marveled at the fortification and the height and the might of the armies. They returned to the encampment and they said, the people are too strong. It would have been better for us to remain in Egypt or to stay here in the wilderness and die. That moment, that chapter in Israel's history, was the ultimate expression of faithlessness. Think about it. This is the people that have been led by, out of Egypt by God. And the same God that splits the sea in half. It's the same God that sinks the most mighty army of the time under the waves. And yet, yet the people are scared. Kadesh Barnea then becomes the geographical center for failure. It is at this place that Miriam will be buried. It is also in this place that Moses and Aaron will be prohibited from entering Canaan because of their disobedience. So in this place, this place that is associated with all of this generational trauma, Moses begins to speak. I want to focus as we start on the third verse of the first chapter of Deuteronomy, which reads, In the fortieth year of the first day of the eleventh month, Moses proclaimed to the Israelites all that the Lord has com had commanded him concerning them. Now jump out to verse 6. Moses begins to speak. And the words he speaks are the words that God has commanded. Now, what words are these? Well, you have stayed long enough at this mountain. Break camp and advance into the hill country of the Amorites. Go to all the neighboring peoples in the Arabic, in the mountains, in the western foothills, in the Negev, and along the coast, to the land of, Can of the Canaanites and to Lebanon, as far as the great river Euphrates. See, I have given you this land. Go in and take possession of the land that the Lord swore he would give to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, and to their descendants after them. Now these people are being called to inhabit a land that, is prom that has been promised to the generations that have preceded them. But it is at this moment and at this place that the history of failure that has befallen all other generations crashes upon them like a ton of weight. Have you ever had a place like this? Now, have you ever had dreams and aspirations, <laughs> hopes, fears, plans? And you go to a place, and you hear a sound, and you smell a scent, and you taste a flavor, and in that moment, your sense remember. They remember the history of failure. In all the trauma, and all the angst comes flooding in. And your eyes well up. And you can't control a, a fountain of emotions that has now been unleashed. Mm -hmm. So how do we solve this generational trauma? This is the question that Moses is having to grapple with at the outset of the book of Deuteronomy. 
And in order to do that, he is proposing, with the aid of Yahweh, to repurpose Kaddish Barnea and to reorient the meaning of the place so that no longer it is associated with trauma, but with the fulfillment of a promise. Now, how is this going to happen? Well, the first thing that I would like to propose is that in order to break away from generational trauma, in order to leave behind epigenetical curses, one must be, first and foremost, intentional. Things don't get better if we don't address them. If we merely silence the voices that cause the angst and the pain, they will be forever haunt us. Richard Schwartz, a psychologist, and one of the early, earliest proponents of fam internal family systems therapy, points out that the only way to conquer trauma is to allow us a space to recognize that the past still has implications in the present. And so we must confront it. And that means we must grieve. We must converse. We must open up spaces for opportunities of healing. We must, in essence, converse to the past and ask those versions of ourselves that continue to be stuck in that moment of extreme discomfort to come forth with us and to experience a new future. So the first key that Moses uses in attempting to rep repurpose Kaddish Barnea as a place of hope is intentionality. Well, what does intentionality look like in the story? Well, listen to what Scripture reads. Verse 12. How can I bear your problems and your burdens and your disputes? This is Moses speaking all by myself. Choose some wise understanding and respected men from each of your tribes, and I will send them over to you. You answered me what you propose is good. So I took the leading men of your tribes, wise and respected men, and appointed them to have authority over you as commanders of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, of tens, and as tribal officials. So the first thing that Moses does in his journey to repurpose this place that caused trauma and instead integrate hope is to be intentional about organization. You, know, you need to have a plan. Whether that is with your spiritual life, whether that is relationally, whether that is theologically, Whatever you are trying to conquer, you must have, first and foremost, a plan. You must get organized. And so Moses, knowing that the place has this enormous weight, this generational trauma that is associated with the locale, says, before we do anything else, we are going to create spaces, organize spaces for people to hear the voices of the past. Again, Schwartz says that internal family systems causes human beings to divide into three primary parts. Schwartz will name them managers, exiles, and firefighters. A manager is the one who is desperately attempting to keep everything together, to forget the pain to not deal with the discomfort, to try to eliminate the trauma in order for one to keep functioning. And then comes the firefighter. Uh, the firefighter is intended to put out those discomfort emotions, those moments where you don't feel good about yourself. Firefighters then 
typically engage us in distractive measures. For some people, it's the abuse of a substance, overeating, binging, purging, cutting. All these behaviors are intended to distract from the real pain of trauma. And then comes the exile. That part of us that is stuck in the past, linked to this story of failures, this generational trauma, this history that continues to assail us. Short says that in order to heal the exile, we must allow ourselves the space to converse with it. And that is what Moses is doing. He's creating an organization or a structure, a family system that allows people to bring forth their complaints, their fears, their aspirations, or their hopes. Now, once this system has been created, what is the next thing that Moses does? Well, he confronts history. And I know that this is the uncomfortable part. See, most of us, most of us subscribe to this idea of forgiving and forgetting. Oh, I'm going to put it in the past. I'm going to bury it in my subconscious. I'm going to not deal with it. Because the memories are too painful. The devastation too great. The failure too embarrassing. Moses spends the bulk of the next chapter recounting Israel's history. He talks about 40 years ago, this other generation that sent out slaves, spies. He talks about the return of the spies. He talks about the fear of their fathers and their mothers. He talks about the fact that when they realized that they weren't going to get into Canaan on their own, they attempted to take the matter into their own hands. He remembers the defeat. He remembers his own failure as a leader. He attempts to take responsibility for that. So how do we then once we've created a system to deal with the past, and once we've told the story of the past, how do we create and shift a paradigm where our history is a history of failure in order to have a history of redemption and conquest? Well, I think Moses does three things as he is recounting this story. First, well, first he recognizes the failure. I mean, telling the story itself, right, friend, is recognizing that him and the generation that he was called to lead failed miserably. There's a wonderful freeing sensation that comes when we simply acknowledge that we were wrong. But acknowledgement isn't enough. Notice that the next thing that Moses do, does is he takes responsibility. He takes responsibility not only for the failure of the people, but for his failure as a leader. He talks about the moment when he st strikes the stone. And he talks about the moment when the people took upon themselves the task of freeing Canaan. So first you acknowledge, then you take responsibility. Then you ask for forgiveness. And notice what verse 45 says in chapter 1. You came back. Wept before the Lord, but he paid no attention to your weeping and turned a deaf ear to you. And so you stayed in Kadesh many days, all the time you spent there. The people come back and they weep. But at no point 
Have they asked for forgiveness? And so it is at this moment, 40 years later, that Moses is telling them the story because acknowledging and taking responsibility isn't enough. One needs to ask for forgiveness. So, once we've acknowledged the past, once we've taken responsibility for, my, for our mistakes, once we have asked for forgiveness, what is, the, what is the final piece in repurposing our history? Well, the final, final piece is we attempt to make amends. And this whole speech in Deuteronomy chapter 1 is intended to allow Israel to first apologize for the mistakes of the past and to then make amends. Now, how are they going to make amends? Well, they are going to do that by walking in faith, by entering Canaan, by finally taking upon themselves the promises that God has delivered since the time of Abraham. I know. I know that dealing with our past failures is different. I know that whether you call it generational trauma or epigenetical curses and historical abuses or legacy burdens, we all carry the weight of not only our past, but the past of our families of origin. And today, God is allowing us the possibility to reconstruct a new history. He's allowing us the possibility to go back in time and leverage those stories in order to, gra to craft a history of redemption. So you might be asking, what do I have to do? Well, acknowledge that none of us is perfect and we all fail. Talk about the past. Talk about your pain. Then take responsibility. In this dialogue, be curious and open. Take responsibility for the times you have failed yourself, for the times you have failed God, and for the times you have failed others. But don't stay there. Don't stay in that space because that space only generates guilt and shame. So move on and ask for forgiveness. And once you have been gifted forgiveness, try to make amends. Move forward in faith. God wants to give you a history of salvation, redemption, conquest, and victory in his name. Amen. So, Joey, we talk about uh, Deuteronomy chapter 1 and yeah. Israel's story, and more specifically, Moses' story. What insights, what things did you find as you read and, and kind of pondered over the lesson that, that stuck with you? Yeah. Um, actually, a lot of the same, same things that you were saying. I, when I was initially reading it, I was wondering, why bring them back? Mm -hmm. Why bring them back to Kadesh? Was there no other entry point? <laughs> like, why bring them back to this place that, of course, just reeks of their failure? It's almost like you're setting yourself up to fail. But I love how you how you said that, that God actually, he wants to address that to bring healing. And um, that, that the failure of their past actually probably was bleeding into this next generation, mm -hmm. even though many of them were either very young or they weren't even born during this time. Um, when they had that last failure, that was still a part of their identity. I, I loved what you brought up about uh, Dora Costa's work. Um, the fact that trauma um, and that even the experiences of our ancestors can be inherent, mm -hmm. inherited and affect our present. Man, talk a little bit more about that. And um, what does that mean for us as uh, in our spiritual journeys? Does that mean that the, the spiritual experiences or the experiences that people have with God, our parents had with God and our, our grandparents, our, you know, the people who, who went before us, 
Does that impact us in the present? Well, Costa would seem to suggest that they do, mm. that both positive and negative experiences are inherited. And by inherited, I don't mean just psychologically or emotionally. Mm. Costa's proposition is that your very genetic makeup changes wow. with these history, with these histories and these stories from the past. And so I think that's oh. what's so powerful about this book that was written so long ago. I mean, we've been talking about epigenetics for 20 odd, 20 some odd years. Mm -hmm. And here it seems, and I don't want to read too much into the text, yeah. but it seems that God is taking these people back to this place of failure because he wants to give them an opportunity to address this past. Wow. Because by, it's only by addressing the past that, as you said, healing can occur in the present. And it's only by having healing in the present that these generational curses can be broken. And so God isn't only, what, what I found so just beautiful about the story, Joey, is that God isn't only trying to restore this new generation and kind of free them from the mistakes of the past god is actually trying to bless future generations mm. so that they don't have to deal with kaddish barnea in a mm. negative way anymore mm. so that they can look at kaddish barnea and say this wasn't the site of our greatest failure this was the site of the culmination of the promises that god had made to our ancestors so god is trying to give them an opportunity to recapture the control of their story. And I think that's extremely empowering and extremely powerful. It really is. And the fact that it's not just, uh, I mean, again, not trying to read too much into this, but that it could have been that this is not just um, psychological, that it's actually physiological, mm -hmm. that this failure could have been hard-coded into their DNA, that experience hard-coded in their DNA shows that just letting time pass and and ignoring that it happened is wasn't enough mm -hmm. that it actually needed to be healed that it's it, it some healing needed to happen so that like you were saying that future generations wouldn't have to still deal with this trauma still deal with this failure um, both psychologically and physiologically that 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 needed to be reinvented mm -hmm. within them wow. wow yeah i think that's why that's why i find just as i was reading uh, this week and, and getting into a little bit about uh, how a lot of uh, people are dealing with trauma now um, mm -hmm. in the healing professions. Uh, that's what, wh why I found there's such a close connection with uh, work like that of Richard Schwartz, who, mm -hmm. who says that you carry all these voices within you, all these parts within you. And by addressing the past, you're actually talking to yourself. Um, I think if Schwartz would read would, would read uh, Deuteronomy 1, he would say, well, what is actually going on is that this generation that is now ready to take over Canaan is actually going back in time in order to talk to their five-year-old selves mm -hmm. who just have seen this massive failure, mm -hmm. right? They they can still remember their mothers crying because their their fathers have been slaughtered as they try to take over the land on their own. They still feel the guilt mm -hmm. um, because they weren't able to, to fulfill God's call for their life. And so uh, Schwartz would say, what Moses is doing is he's talking to those parts mm -hmm. and he's actually attempting to go back and heal those parts mm. so that now in the present we have uh, a better chance of fulfilling our potential our god-given potential so again this this idea of uh, family systems approach to uh, healing trauma which has been around maybe for 30 years mm -hmm. um again without reading too much into the text it seems like like moses is attempting to do this a long, long, long time ago. Wow, wow. And for us, it just shows the, the importance of addressing those moments of failure, to not just ignore them. Because, you know, especially if it's if a lot of time has passed, it's easy for, for me to just think, oh, well, why bring it up again, right? What, what, what good is it gonna do to actually bring up this pain, this hurt, this loss, this failure? bring it up again 
and, and address it. You know, enough time has passed. Maybe, maybe it's been forgotten. Maybe it doesn't affect me anymore. But what this passage seems to suggest, and also the work of Schwartz and, and Dora Costa seems to suggest, is that actually just because we ignore it doesn't make the, time, the pain, the loss, the, the failure go away. Yeah. And actually, in some ways, that it can continue to affect us even more powerfully as time goes on. Yeah. Yeah. Ah. So therapists would say that that's not that that person, that this part of you mm -hmm. that doesn't want to deal with it is actually a manager mm -hmm. that is saying, hey, we're scared. <laughs> we know that dealing with it is going to bring pain. Yeah. But so we're, we're, we're going to hide. And what what therapists would argue, I think, is um, that this that this manager isn't Miguel Mendez or Joey, oh, it's not our real selves, our God-created selves. Mm -hmm. It's simply this part of us that is extremely afraid. Mm -hmm. And in this this text keep, keeps echoing in my ears as I think about just talking to that manager in us that is afraid to deal with this mm -hmm. trauma because, well, it's in the past and I don't want to bring up all these emotions. I just want to lock them in, in the box. And I think... Uh, what what your God given self this 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 divine essence that exists in all of us I think what what that is saying is hey remember perfect love casts all fear mm. casts out all fear and so I think uh, if if we take Jesus at, at his word in his desire to dwell in us that's our self. Mm. It's the indwelling of Jesus. It's the indwelling of the Spirit in us mm. that is saying, I'm going to go through this journey with you, mm. and we're going to address these issues in the past because I want to free you from fear, wow. from this fear of failure, this same fear of failure that I'm sure is plaguing this generation at Kadesh Barnea. Wow. So if we don't address it, it comes out in very unhealthy ways that is not authentic to the person that God has created us yeah. to be. Yeah, because you're going to have, so I, I think you're going to have, uh, even if you don't deal with it, you're going to have kind of spillage. It's like, mm. a, it's like trying to, I had a, a hose in my house. Um, that I use to water. Uh, we have some plants that that I that I water, and uh, my dog had bit into the hose, and so uh, there was these these little tiny minuscule holes, mm -hmm. and it wasn't making the pressure great. So we were having pressure issues. So rather than going and buying a new hose, what I ended up doing is I got some duct tape and just wrapped it around. And yeah, it was preventing some spillage. I was able to water the plants, but the pressure wasn't great. And so you could tell the part where the holes were because there was leakage there. And I think the same thing happens when we don't address address these issues. When we're still being held captive by fear, there's this leakage that yeah. comes out. And as you're saying, it comes out in very unhealthy ways. Yeah. And again, uh, systems therapists call these firefighters, right? You have these unhealthy behaviors, uh, whether it be like real unhealthy behaviors like uh, self-harm or suicidal ideations or um, substance abuse or even, you know, uh, some risk-taking behaviors or anger, um, mm. short fuses, all these things that that we say, well, I, I just, I'm just, I don't know why this makes me so yeah. upset, but it really does. Yes. And we we t we tell ourselves, well, that's not connected in any way to that. But mm -hmm. it seems that what what uh, the people at uh, in, in Deuteronomy one are are dealing with is is this leakage. And so God does. God says, I don't want these issues to impact your fulfillment of the covenant and to continue mm -hmm. assailing you as you move forward. So we're going to have to deal with them. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think all of us have had times when we just surprised ourselves, like, why did I get so angry? Mm -hmm. Or why am I all of a sudden so emotional and crying? Or, or even things like unhealthy eating habits, mm -hmm. right? Overeating or like, why? These, this thing that I didn't used to have problems with, now it's exhibiting in myself. And we start to try to deal with the symptoms themselves, like, oh, I, I need to just force myself to not be angry, mm -hmm. just to be more patient, rather than 
dealing with what you call the underlying symptom that creates the leakage. Yeah. 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 Um, and so I, I again would 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 recommend uh, people that are that are dealing with, you know, symptoms. I think that assail all of us, like mm-hmm. you've mentioned, anger, uh, just pain, sadness, overeating, over exercising, mm-hmm. whatever it is, whatever excess, whatever imbalance we have in mm-hmm. in our lives. Uh, begin to ask those questions of yourself, and if you're dealing with more serious issues tell somebody Mm. go get help go get somebody that is trained talk to somebody who is trained in unpacking all those all those issues because a lot of times i think i think if you ask the people at kaddish barnea um as they're excited going into into canaan are you thinking about your parents and and their failure they probably would have said no this is great We're, we're great but sometimes you need you need a guide to kind of help you to unpack that. So don't go through the suffering period alone. Uh, mm-hmm. Talk to someone. Talk to talk to someone who has some training and kind of helping you uh, f- figure out where where the, where this leakage is. Yeah, and that's that's that first part that you you addressed that Moses did right that they they actually took time to acknowledge mm-hmm. their failure. It wasn't ignored to actually bring it up. Mm-hmm. So that it can be it can be addressed, yeah. 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 And um, I loved how Austin. I think it was two, three weeks ago, two weeks ago, um, where he he made the point in his sermon that in conflict or in difficult situations, the first step is to take time to feel your feelings, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> to actually recognize what I'm going through and say and just be perfectly honest yeah. about that. And and. Moses seems to be able. To, Moses seems to do that for for right. these people. He brings it up and allows them to feel their feelings and acknowledge it. Yeah, no, and 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 then what he does. So okay, let's let's open up a space to acknowledge it, mm-hmm. and I think Moses understands that the floodgates are going to be open, and so he says, "Well, let let me organize some leaders mm-hmm. that'll that'll provide you a space mm-hmm. to deal with with this floodgate yeah. that's going to open um, so to have a plan ab- about how you're going to do that that is really really important mm-hmm. uh, whether it's a friend that you confide in whether it's a spiritual mentor that you have um, whether it's a trained clinician uh, that is helping you unpack these issues. I think to have a plan of how we're going to feel the feelings mm-hmm. is important. For some of us, simply acknowledging, simply acknowledging that they're there is enough. For others of us, a uh, more structured system is, is going to be necessary. And so whatever it is, we need to have a plan before we unleash uh, the fountain of emotions that's yeah. going to come. Yeah. And then once you've done that, it's not just enough to feel your feelings. We've been talking, Joey, a lot about differentiation over the mm. past few weeks. The second step is I need to take responsibility mm. for my role in creating these feelings. Mm-hmm. And so it's funny that Moses says, okay, I'm not just going to tell you about your parents. I'm actually going to make you part of the story and I'm going to make myself part of the story and I'm going to kind of allow ourselves the opportunity to take responsibility wow. for the feelings and for the failure. Wow, I want to talk more about that in a moment, but I, I just wanted to address first what you said about the organization, because when you were talking about that, it was kind of a eye-opening experience for me because you know, I, know I, I, I thought the reason why Moses organized his people in that way is so that he wouldn't have to deal with all of the, you know, the, the petty little stuff mm-hmm. that came up. What you're saying here when you're reading through Deuteronomy is so, so right. It seems like Moses is framing that not just, this is not just a system to deal with your petty problems. This is a system that we had in place to deal with the failure experience mm-hmm. that was defined at this moment and that you've had to deal with and process mm-hmm. for 40 years. And I didn't have it in me to deal, to help you process all, for all of you right. to process that. And I knew that God was gonna bless you and grow you and all the people that came, I didn't have it in me to deal with that myself, to help you process that myself. So I created, you know, this, we created the system so that people, all these other leaders could help us mm-hmm. process this, this failure mm-hmm. and do it not just at this moment, but they've been doing it for 40 years. Is that right? 
Yeah, that's so. So I think that's that's what I find so moving about the story, right? That uh, Moses becomes this this lightning rod that has been inspired by God to then say, okay, we're going to give back to you as a community the authority mm -hmm. of figuring out a way through the messiness mm -hmm. that is this emotional entanglement. And so he does, again, not to read too much into the text, but we're going to go back a little bit to systems therapy and how uh, systems thought works, uh, both uh, dealing with trauma and dealing with uh, with leadership uh, issues. So any any systems uh, theorist would tell you that uh, you try to find within whether it's a company or a family or a church or whatever it whatever system you have, you try to f find out the person that is most self-differentiated. Mm -hmm. Some of us are naturally not as self-differentiated as as others, and mm -hmm. that's okay. Mm -hmm. But you try to find uh, people who have that giftedness, and then as a leader, you pour into them. Yes. Because by helping them, they're going, the whole system is being repaired. Or mm -hmm. in, uh, if you're a clinician, the whole system is quote-unquote in therapy. Mm -hmm. And so it seems like Moses is, is taking that approach, right? He's saying, okay, there's some people here that have that giftedness. I'm going to pour into them in order for the whole uh, of the system mm -hmm. to start uh, exhibiting some modification and uh, some repair. Yeah. So whether it's families or churches or companies or organizations, I mean, Moses' model of selecting several people that you that you can identify as being people that could bring healing to the mm -hmm. system just by the, by the type of person that they are, by the character that they have of being able to engage in, in difficult situations and not be overwhelmed by mm -hmm. them and, and be steadfast, finding those people and, and then putting them in positions where they can influence the system yeah. as a whole. That's that's a really powerful path to healing. That is that I think that's the only path to healing. And I know what our friend because as you're talking, Joey, I'm thinking. Oh, I know what our friends uh, watching are thinking. Well, what characters and what characteristics do these leaders have to have? Hmm. And I think the pro, there's two things that I think a leader like this needs to have. First hmm. off. You need to be a little bit curious, mm -hmm. right? Because you're going to be going on this journey that is uncomfortable. And so uh, fear, I think, what fear does is it, it kills and it zaps any curiosity. So you need to have curiosity. But the second and probably the most important thing that I think we ought to look for in, in this type of leader is that they need to remain connected with the system mm -hmm. without taking responsibility for the system's failures, mm. right? The whole point here is that I take responsibility for your for my mistakes, you take responsibility for my mistakes, and there's somebody for you, sorry, for your mistakes. <laughs> and there's somebody out there that is guiding us through that process mm -hmm. and seeing what that looks like um, and remaining connected to us mm -hmm. without taking all of our baggage on them yeah think about jesus think about jesus in in the gospel of john he re he is the ultimate self-differentiated leader he mm -hmm. remains connected to peter right i'm connected to you peter but you're gonna have to figure out and take responsibility for denying me. Mm. And so he goes to Peter and says, Simon, do you love me? Yeah. Simon, do you love me? Yeah. Simon, do you love me? And so Jesus is intimately connected to Peter, but he still realizes that the only way Peter heals is if Peter takes responsibility for Peter's failure. Wow. And so I think this is these are the characteristics that in a church or a company or a family system, we need to find we need to find godly people who are curious and who have the capacity to remain connected without taking all the weight and all the baggage um, of the other people's failures on themselves because that uh well that simply 
curtails this process by which I heal when I take responsibility for my failures. Wow. Yet, uh, and yet another perfect example of Jesus taking Peter, God taking people to a place of failure and reinventing the mm -hmm. story and allowing them mm. to, to, to heal. Yeah. Wow. And I, I, I love that, those two characteristics of curiosity and that differentiation where I'm able to um, know who I am and separate my, my identity from, from, uh, from the system, yet still remain connected to it. And, and like you pointed out, Jesus was the ultimate mm -hmm. example of both of those characteristics, which is why what I found where the cross-section of family systems theory and, 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 and theology seem to intersect is that really becoming that type of person is sort of the result of being in a transformative relationship with God. Because God is that type of person and God is reproducing that kind of character within right. us. And when when our identity, because what, what makes this so difficult is a lot of times we let the outside circumstances influence what we think mm -hmm. about ourselves. Like, what do other people think about me? What do other people think about the work that I'm doing? Those things, that's what makes it so difficult to remain differentiated and to remain curious because we start to take things personally. Mm -hmm. But when our identity is grounded in Christ, in, in knowing that no matter what is happening around us, Christ, we are the we are children of God. Mm -hmm. When our identity is grounded in Christ, and that is so firm, then it doesn't matter what other people think, and that allows us to be curious yeah. and differentiated. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. I think, I think that's the key. I think the idea, right, uh, both theology, um, family systems theory, Deuteronomy one, is that the relationships you have with your history and your story not only affect, affect you, they affect the people around you. Mm -hmm. And so the hope then would be that the relationship you have with Christ not only affects me, but it starts affecting the people around me. Wow. And it allows me to, as you've said, remain connected while also remaining differentiated, which I think is the hardest thing to do mm -hmm. because as you mentioned, we tend to take things personal. Yeah. We tend to take these personal failures, which is why I think the last two steps that that we see Moses striving towards mm -hmm. is y'all got to ask for forgiveness, yeah. right? It's not enough yeah. to, to kind of uh, recognize the mistakes of the past. Mm -hmm. It's not enough to open a space to talk about those mm -hmm. and to acknowledge them and say, oh, I really messed up here. Healing really happens. That's just the diagnosis. Yeah. Healing occurs when we ask for forgiveness. And I think that's the mistake that this, for, that this generation 40 years ago makes. Mm. They come back defeated and they cry out to the Lord, but they cry out to the Lord because they failed. Mm. At no point do they say, you know what, God, we are sorry. We're sorry mm. first for not trusting you. Mm -hmm. And we're sorry for then when you told us not to go for disobeying you. At no point do they do that. Yeah. And so now Moses is saying, hey, you know what? We have the opportunity to ask for forgiveness. Yeah. And then once you've asked for forgiveness and you've been gifted that gift, then you go out and you live a life that is responsible and that recognizes that gift. And the way you do that is you make amends. Yeah. You know, that's a skip that I often want to skip. <laughs> mm, that's the hardest step. Oh, that's man. the hardest step. Oh man, I know that when I, you know, get into an argument with someone, and I know that I eventually realize that I'm in the wrong, or you know, get, do something wrong, I just kind of want to slide past mm -hmm. that step. You know, okay, I, I made a mistake. You know, I, 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 I've recognized that within myself. But do I really? Do I really have to ask for forgiveness? Do I really? I mean, what, what? good does that do any anybody that just makes me feel embarrassed right uh, why why do i need and yet what you're saying is that healing cannot happen unless we actually take that step to not just move on you know skip the forgiveness step and and go okay i admit that i did wrong i'll do better in the future mm -hmm. actually there is a necessity of actually asking for forgiveness and what you pointed out is 
them being unwilling to do that, skipping that step, going from, oh, I, oh yeah, we messed up and okay, God, we'll do, we'll do better. We'll go and attack. Skipping that step is what led to the 40 year wandering yeah. is not asking yeah. for forgiveness. Yeah, because what is forgiveness, Joey, if not saying that the past is not going to govern our relationship anymore? Mm. That's forgiveness, yeah. right? Forgiveness is when you when you recognize and you say, hey, I know the past has slanted our relationship in mm. this way. I don't want that anymore. And mm. forgiving someone is saying, I no longer will allow the past to govern our relationship. Mm. And so if we're talking about how do we heal from past trauma and past issues and past baggage and histories of failure, then we need to break with the past allowing to control our relational experiences in the present. And in order for that to happen, as, as I think you've so artfully stated, forgiveness is necessary. Yeah. Even if many years have passed, even if it's the previous generation that did it. Because if you look at the Israelites, I mean, the people, the, the children that were there, the children of the, the people that were there could have easily said, well, we didn't make that decision. We're not the ones that decided not to go in right. last time. That was that was our parents. That has nothing to do with me. And yet there seems to be a need for some kind of forgiveness, right. for a request for forgiveness and an apology to happen. Um, there's a story and we'll end with that. I'll just we'll end with this. I'll just take uh, your thoughts on, on what, what you think about this. So there's a story uh, that's going on in here in Southern California about an African-American family uh, who bought, years ago, uh, beach uh, oceanfront property. And uh, a few years later, eminent domain, we're talking about, you know, 100 years ago, eminent domain actually uh, prevented them from keeping the property. And so the property passed back onto the city and the city then sold it on to developers. And this, this plot of land, um, stayed in control of other people for 100 years and obviously the price now of the property has increased exponentially etc cetera, etc cetera. something really really neat happened a few months ago when the current owners of the property um, restored the deed to the current descendants wow. of the original owners of the property wow. and what most shocked me when when you know you were going through this history of the city saying yeah we 100 years ago completely different people made a mistake we're going to we're going to restore and repair that mistake was that the original what excited the original owner the original descendant the descendants of the original owners wasn't the fact that they had more money in the bank account none of them talked about the financial windfall yeah. they all though uh, talked about the healing experience of vindication that occurred wow. um, for not only their ancestors, but for them. Mm. And so, yes, apologizing for the mistakes of the past, even as you're saying, if a hundred uh, if years have passed, in this case, 40 years, in that case, a hundred years, has immense, immense power for healing. Won't you pray for us? Good and great God, we want to thank you so much for being a God of redemption. You know, it's easy to see those 40 years that the Israelites journeyed through the wilderness as a punishment, as a vindictive, vindictive uh, way of, of punishing um, the Israelites and saying, you know, because you wouldn't listen to me, now I'm going to make you suffer for 40 years. But what this passage seems to suggest is that those 40 years were not so much punishment to cause pain, but punishment to lead to redemption. Mm -hmm. And so we want to thank you for being a God who doesn't give on us, give up on us, even after 40 years, even after 100 years, mm -hmm. you still remain faithful to us. And we ask that you help us to also be people that are that committed, that tenacious for healing is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, may God inhabit your own stories and may God shift your history of failure and trauma 
for a future of salvation and redemption. That is our prayer. Until next week, God bless you. Thank you.